This talk, uh, so again, most of the meeting you've been focusing about low EF heart failure, um, but now we'll talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which we used to call diastolic heart failure, but we know it's much more complicated than that now, so we call it HEFPEF. And then at the end of the talk, we'll talk um, a little bit about amyloid. And these are, again, my disclosures, and again, not relevant to what I'll talk about. So um, I'll touch a little bit on the epidemiology, a little bit on pathophys, but um, trying to make it more clinically relevant. I think that's what the test is going to want to. We'll focus more on how to make the diagnosis and treatment. And then, um, we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit about amyloid at the end. So I think everybody in the room knows there are two kinds of heart failure. This is still debated a little bit, um, that it's just all one spectrum. But um, it's not. You can see the distribution right here. It's bimodal. Uh, there's one kind of heart failure um, with low EF, where men outnumber women. And then there's another kind, around 50-60% ejection fraction, where women outnumber men by two to one. Um, and these people look different. We've seen very steady incidence and prevalence rates, or even a slight decline, for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in the past couple of years. Uh, but since the 80s, there's been a steady increase in the recognition and possibly the incidence and prevalence of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. In fact, it's growing relative to half ref by 10% per decade. It's half right now, and it will be the leading cause of heart failure by 2020. Despite the fact that the EF is normal, outcomes are similarly bad to what we see in HEF-REF. And you can see here in a community-based study, only about 35-40% of people are alive at five years. Now, if you look at studies comparing outcomes in patients randomized to trials who are always much healthier, then REF does worse than PEF. Um, but in the community, for all intents and purposes, um, they're, they're pretty similar. Hearts look much different. Uh, this is autopsy samples. So on the top is a half-ref patient. On the bottom is, is half-pef. And uh, on my boards, I had to calculate Laplace's law. So I thought I'd uh, just include it here. Wall stress is equal to chamber radius times intracavitary pressure divided by wall thickness. And uh, the reason I put this here um, is not to torture you with biophysics, but because uh, there's an important clinical sequela from this. Um, it turns out that BNP and NT pro-BNP are released in response to stretch of the myocardium. They are most closely correlated with diastolic wall stress. Because the wall stress is much lower in HEFPEF, because they have smaller ventricles and thicker walls, their BNP is much lower than what we see in HEFREF, and that's very consistently seen in all the studies. Um, some of the, gu the European guidelines still say that you should have an elevated BNP. That is not the case. A normal BNP does not exclude HEFPEF. It does not. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's often normal. Do not assume the patient doesn't have HEFPEF because the BNP is normal. Um, the pathophysiology could talk for the whole half hour about. It's um, fascinating, very complex. I'll just try to summarize it in this one slide. So there's diastolic dysfunction. So prolonged relaxation, increased chamber stiffness. This leads to an increase in filling pressures. This is why we used to just call it, call it diastolic heart failure. This then causes elevation in pulmonary venous pressure and capillary pressure and leads to symptoms of dyspnea. It also causes remodeling, though, at the alveolar capillary interface, which gets stiffer and thicker. And that also leads to more symptoms of breathlessness. That chronic increase in LV filling pressures causes the LA pressure to go up, so the LA starts to dilate and remodel. Atrial function gets worse. They start to develop atrial fibrillation. When your LA pressure gets high and your pulmonary venous pressure gets high, your PA pressure has to go up too, right? Because it's they're downstream of the PA, so you get secondary pulmonary hypertension. The combination of high RV afterload from PH and loss of AV synchrony from loss of sinus rhythm really begets and leads to RV dysfunction, which is seen in about one third of patients and is clearly associated with worse outcomes in people with HEFPEF. Your RV starts to fail, that's when you start to get systemic edema, congestion, ascites, and ultimately cachexia.
There's more than that, though. Despite the fact that the EF is normal on the left side, there is clearly LV systolic dysfunction. When you use tissue Doppler imaging or strain or other um, load-independent measures of chamber and myocardial function, systolic function is not normal, especially when they stress, when they do exercise. This begets or worsens the diastolic dysfunction. There's arterial problems. The aortas are very stiff. There's abnormal endothelial-dependent vasorelaxation in these people. That also contributes to diastolic dysfunction. Heart rate's usually normal at rest, but they have less increase in heart rate with activity. Chronotropic incompetence is seen in about two-thirds to three-quarters of patients. So then all of these things markedly diminish the cardiac output response to activity. So if you cath one of these people, usually they have a normal resting cardiac output, but then instead of going up like this with exercise, they go up like this. It's like they're operating almost at their maximal cardiac output and they're very limited. So that, along with the pulmonary venous hypertension and PA hypertension, worsens the symptoms. You have all these bad symptoms. You stop doing things, activity avoidance. Then you start to get problems in your muscles and your periphery. And that's clearly been demonstrated as well now. A lot of these people develop that, and then that worsens and creates this vicious cycle. More dyspnea, more fatigue, more limitation. So this is, it's not just, I'm, you know, I'm, it's not just diastolic dysfunction. It's much more complicated than that. It's many of these things. Now, um, what ties this all together? That's not known right now. Uh, but there's a lot of thinking that it's related to some of the risk factors that we see. So HFPEF is a disease of age, women, and people with comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, insulin resistance, and obesity. One of the prevailing thinking right now, pre prevailing paradigms, is that this leads to systemic inflammation, which impairs NO nitric oxide bioavailability. Uh, you get less NO, you get less activation of its downstream pathway, soluble guanylate cyclase, which leads to less cyclic GMP, which leads to less activation of protein kinase G. So I mention this because protein kinase G is very important for antihypertrophy, diastolic relaxation, lucitropic function. It ties together a lot of the ideas. So a lot of the new treatments that are coming out right now and some of the treatments that have been tested are targeting this pathway, trying to restore this nitric oxide cyclic GMP pathway. Um, but it's still not totally clear that's the right move. We'll step back for a philosophical moment. What is HEFPEF? Um, I would say heart failure, I'm a hemodynamic person. I, this is what I do, so I see the world hemodynamically. So if you got a neurohormonal person up here, you'd get a different answer. But I would say, these are objective things that I can measure. It is an inability of the heart to pump blood to the body at a rate commensurate with its needs, or to do that pumping only at the expense of high filling pressures. That's the heart failing. That's failing to do its job. So that's heart failure hemodynamically. And if your EF is 50 or more, then that's HFPEF. So that's what I would define HFPEF. How do you make the diagnosis? It's not so easy. It's a clinical diagnosis, and it relies on finding some sort of objective evidence of high filling pressures or congestion. So um, if somebody has jugular distension and a gallop, curly B lines, you know, you're done. That's, that's HFPEF for sure. If the BNP, I said if it's normal, it doesn't rule it out, but if it's high, that's, that's helpful. There are lots of echo indicators. This E to E prime ratio, if that's high, that's another strong indicator that filling pressures are high. It's not very sensitive, though. So oftentimes it's not high in people that do have high filling pressures. If the LA starts to dilate, so if the LA volume is increased, if the PA pressure goes up, those are all indicators. If you can't tell from all that, the gold standard, of course, is CAF. So that's high filling pressures, what we think about most times. Inadequate output, though. Um, Again, they normally have a normal resting output, but they can't enhance their output. You can measure that with cardiopulmonary exercise testing uh, or with cardiac catheterization. Once you've brought all this together and said, yeah, this is clinical heart failure for sure, a key step is to exclude other causes that we treat differently. I'll come back to that. So um, these are the 2007 ESC guidelines. Um, Signs and symptoms, normal heart size, normal EF, um, and then some evidence of diastolic dysfunction by cath or this high EE prime. Um, it can be an intermediate elevation of the EE prime with things like a high BNP or other echo Doppler findings. This has been supplanted now in the latest ESC guidelines. 
which are just this year, so they're not going to be on the test, but I just included here. So you look at the pretest probability based on clinical characteristics and history, and then you say, well, their BNP has to at least be a little bit elevated. And then if it is, then you go on and look for some sort of structural disease by echo, left atrial enlargement, LVH, high EE prime. And if this, according to the ESC, this is sufficient to make the diagnosis. Um, so this is definitely not on the test because um, this is our data that's like in review right now. Maybe one of you out there is reviewing the paper right now. If you are, look very favorably, please. So, so this is, but so we've put this to the test um, using gold standard patients, and the sensitivity is very poor for this approach. So, um, I think that it's specific. So, if they have all these findings, that's very good, but it's very insensitive. So, what do we look for? We look for these indicators. We look for pulmonary hypertension. If you see a high PA systolic pressure echo estimate, um, that in an older patient with a normal EF, that's probably HEFPEF. Over 80% of patients in this community-based study with um, proven HEFPEF had pH by echo. Remember, as your LA pressure goes up, as your wedge goes up, your PA also has to go up. And in the early stages of disease, there's this one-to-one -one relationship. So the pH is really an indicator of the uh, pulmonary venous hypertension and high LV pressures. When you compare things like EE prime and LV mass and LA volume, actually PASP does quite well. So these are all the indirect indicators of filling pressures that we look for on the echocardiogram are very useful. So if those are high, that's great. But the problem with that and the problem with echo and the problem with these ESC criteria is not everyone with HEFPEF is congested. You can have this disease and not be congested. You could either be on diuretics or, or whatever um, and still have the disease. So this is a typical patient like this. Normal EF. Significant symptoms, looks euvolemic, normal BNP, kind of a little bit of diastolic dysfunction on the echo, but, you know, 70-year-old woman. What do you do with this? If you did the algorithm, it would say it's not HEFPEF. Uh, but when we see some signals, but it's not clear, this is the kind of patient that we would refer to the cath lab for an invasive assessment. So that was done in this woman. And here's um, uh, wedge pressure in yellow and LV pressure in pink. And they're stone cold normal, 12. Not heart failure, right? You did an exam, you did an echo, you did a BNP, history, cath. Well, she's not symptomatic at rest. She's symptomatic when she does stuff. So you wouldn't tell somebody with exertional chest tightness they don't have coronary disease from a normal resting ECG. So why would you apply that thinking to the evaluation of heart failure? It's ludicrous. So we need to assess the hemodynamics during the stress. And this is what happens to this lady with 40 watts of exercise. Filling pressures go through the roof. The LVEDP and the wedge pressure are now 40. She's really short of breath. So this is HEFPEF 2. This is euvolemic HEFPEF. And we've shown this now. You take patients just like the case I showed you, some risk factors, some indicators, but you can't clearly make the diagnosis. You take them to the table of truth in the cath lab, and a little over half of them show hemodynamic derangements that are diagnostic of heart failure. And this is why it's so hard. When you just look at them at rest, they look no different than anybody else. You get their feet up to start pedaling, and you start to see a little difference. All that blood that's sitting in the veins of the legs gets translocated back into the central circulation. If you've got a stiff ventricle, it, it can't accommodate that blood. And then just really one minute of exercise, I'm, I do my, we do a supine cycle, um, you, you see complete separation in the two groups here. So it really doesn't even have to be a really high level exercise. So in these people, exercise, invasive exercise testing is the gold standard to make the diagnosis. So um, there is not a universal agreement on how to make this diagnosis. I showed you the ESC criteria. I think there's problems with it. I think that if you, they're specific, so if they do meet those criteria, you're fine. But I think that a lot of people that don't meet those criteria also have FF. In fact, I know they do from looking at our own data. So this is how I look at it. Good old fashioned Framingham criteria, history, physical, you know, jugular distension, curly B lines. You're good. High PA systolic pressure, high EE prime ratio. Good indicator, LA enlargement. If there are other things that we frequently see on echo, like LVH or concentric remodeling, another strong indicator. Um, if the BNP, again, is high, 
um, or if they got better with diuretics, another indicator. We didn't talk about cardiopulmonary testing, but a lot of these people typically show reduced exercise capacity, so if you do do that, um, that's also helpful. And then typical demographics. If it's a 75-year-old lady who's obese and has atrial fibrillation and um, diabetes, then yeah, that's probably HFPEF. If it's a 30-year-old guy with no comorbidities, it's time to sharpen up your biotome. That's probably somebody with something weird uh, if they clearly have heart failure. Maybe they have Gaucher's disease or something like that. The more boxes you check, the higher the probability. Um, if you've got four of these boxes checked, you're done. Um, if you're still uncertain, that's the kind of patient you take to the cath lab for an invasive assessment. And if the invasive assessment's normal at rest, you do exercise to stress the system. Okay, so we'll change over to treatment. So here's a forest plot showing the hazard ratios and confidence intervals for things that we know work very well in HEFREF. ARBs, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, you know, very consistent. You've heard about this already. 20, 30% improvement in meaningful outcomes like CV death, heart failure hospitalization. They're all less than one, so they all work statistically. But in trials, and <clears throat> registries that have looked at these agents in HEFPEF, the typical neurohormonal blockers, they just don't work. All of these cross unity. So there's been basically a failure of neurohormonal antagonists in the, the other half of all heart failure patients in HEFPEF. So what do we do? We need to do something because the patients are clearly out there. One um, mechanistically sound thing to do is to lower filling pressures. And, um, you know, people of the purists have said, well, there's no evidence for diuretics for years, but now there is some evidence for diuretics. And I think you've seen this slide before in the meeting. Uh, this is from the CardioMEMS trial. So the CardioMEMS, again, PA pressure-guided therapy versus not PA pressure-guided therapy. But PA pressure-guided therapy really ends up being mostly increasing diuretics. So it, it, it's not really a trial of diuretics, but it's mostly a trial of diuretics. So if you diurese people who have high filling pressures and high PA pressures, you can substantially reduce their heart failure hospitalizations. And this is only the PEF patients. This is only half PEF. The number needed to treat in the trial in this analysis uh, to prevent a heart failure hospitalization over a year and a half was just two. So by all means, if somebody with half PEF is congested, give them a diuretic. Unfortunately, not everything that lowers filling pressures works. So um, this is the data from the NEAT trial, um, which we just published in New England Journal last year. So crossover trial, isosorbide mononitrate, IMDR or placebo, force titrated up. And we thought that that would lower filling pressures and make, pe make people do more stuff. But um, contrary to that hypothesis, there was actually a reduction in activity levels. So this organic nitrate, patients that are on IMDR, um, I'm usually pulling them off unless there's some other compelling indication like they have angina or some other reason to be on it. So not everything that works to lower filling pressures um, works for HEFPEF. I talked earlier about NO and cyclic G. Another way to increase cyclic G levels is to decrease its breakdown with phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors like sildenafil. And there was a lot of reason, we know that works in pH, uh, there was a lot of reason to suspect it would work in HEFPEF, but we tested that in the RELAX trial. And compared to placebo in a multicenter trial, no benefit in terms of exercise capacity or echo or quality of life or neurohormones. PDE5 inhibitors don't work for HEFPEF either. So the guidelines, in addition to giving diuretics if they're hypervolemic, is to treat comorbidities like hypertension, which is present in 80 or 90 percent of patients. But we do need to be careful because these people have greater vulnerability to preload reduction. So this is a study in the cath lab where we gave nitroprusside to patients with HEFPEF and HEFREF. And this is a cumulative distribution plot showing all the responses for HEFREF patients. And you can see this is zero. So almost everybody enjoyed an improvement in forward stroke volume when they got some nipride with HEFREF. And we know that. You know, Jay Cohn showed that back in the early 70s. Um, this is HEFPEF, so it's shifted over, and that's very significant if you do an ANOVA or a T-test. But I show you the data this way so that you can appreciate this group that had a reduction in stroke volume. That's very rare in HEFREF with NIPRIDE, but about 36% of the patients with HEFPEF, even though they had a wedge pressure of 20 to 25, had a reduction in stroke volume with nitroprusside. 
That's not going to happen from afterload reduction, so it must be a decrease in venous return and preload. So some of these patients, they, they, they're so stiff, they rely on that increased filling pressure to adequately distend their ventricles, and if you take them down too far with diuretics or vasodilators, you can get in trouble. They also have a greater drop in blood pressure with vasodilators. So you treat hypertension, uh, but you need to maybe be a bit more careful than what we do in HEFREF. I showed you earlier ACE inhibitors and ARBs failed. There was a lot of hope for um, mineralocorticoid antagonists, all this profibrotic, aldosterone. This led to the TopCat trial, which was published in the New England Journal two years ago now, and um, like the others, unfortunately failed. So no reduction in the composite endpoint of heart failure hospitalization, um, aborted cardiac death, or CV uh, mortality. But when they looked at heart failure hospitalizations, um, that was reduced. But of course, when you see a secondary endpoint that's met and you didn't meet your primary, you have to look at it you know, very, very carefully. Uh, but then Mark Pfeffer published this um, nice post-mortem uh, examination of the trial in CIRC later that year. And um, this is interesting. If you look at people in the Western Hemisphere in the Americas, the drug actually worked. Post hoc analysis, not pre-specified, uh, but it did appear to work. So if they would have only done it here, it would have, uh, in Americas, it would have worked. Um, in Russia and the Republic of Georgia, which is the other 50% of the patients in the trial, nothing. I would also um, ask you to look over here at the y-axis. This is the cumulative probability of events after six years. It's very low. These are not heart failure patients. So some people are interpreting this to say, well, if you get the right, if you take a real HEFPEF patient, the drug works. But the purists, and you know, trial purists, um, that's not the way the trial was done. We can't accept that. So people are interpreting this differently. But I think it's certainly reasonable to treat, especially hypervolemia and blood pressure with a, with a mineralocorticoid antagonist. AFib is very common in HEFPEF. If you look at people with HEFPEF ever, so prior history, at the time you're seeing them in the clinic or later, two-thirds of them will have AFib at some point. Two-thirds. It's really, really common. The presence of AFib and HEFPEF is associated with worse outcomes, worse exercise capacity, RV dilatation, and worsening RV function, even if you account for the severity of the pulmonary hypertension. So it's kind of an indicator of a more malignant phenotype of heart failure. Now, we know in HEFREF, uh, we know fairly well, it's a pretty good study that was done several years ago, that rate versus rhythm doesn't really matter. But that trial has never been done in HEFPEF. And anecdotally, a lot of these patients really are reliant on their atrial kick. So my practice is generally to really aggressively go after trying to restore sinus rhythm. And I think that um, that's, that's an appropriate thing to do until we have some strong evidence one way or the other. So these are the recommendations for uh, treatment from Dr. Chatterjee 25 years ago. And this is the progress we've made. <laughs> I don't have the latest update here, but... So we're kind of doing the late 80s medicine. but So we have ischemia on here, too. Ischemia causes diastolic dysfunction and systolic dysfunction. What do we know about that? Very little. And it kind of motivated us to do this study where we looked at people who had all gone to the cath lab, all had clear-cut HEFPEF. Presence of coronary disease was associated with worse outcome. This, again, this is not a trial. This is not a prospective trial. This is retrospective observational data. But the patients with HEFPEF who were revascularized had a better survival than the patients with HEFPEF that were not revascularized, independent of other things that we look at. In fact, it was just as good as people without coronary disease. So again, in the absence of having things to treat, it plausibly explains things. There's some retrospective data. A lot of people are really aggressively looking for coronary disease and treating it. Um, and there's some problems with stress testing. Many people are sending them straight to the cath lab. I'm not saying that one way or the other. I'm saying that that's something that we certainly want to consider in these patients. Well, what about exercise and weight loss? Who are you not going to advise that for? Obviously. But um, Delane Kitzman published this very nice, very elegant trial earlier this year in JAMA, which means it won't be on the boards, but this is up here for your own practice, where they randomized patients with HEFPEF, obese, BMI 39, mostly women, strong work in a clinical trial, um, to either exercise training for 20 weeks, 20 weeks of diet, or 20 weeks of diet and exercise. And you can see progressively greater weight loss the more you did. The diet was very effective. 
And this was coupled with a substantial, significant, clinically and statistically significant improvement in exercise capacity, both with exercise or diet. But the combination of both um, clearly was the way to go. So unfortunately, HF action was only done in HEF-REF. And CMS is not going to pay for HEF-PEF uh, cardiac rehab unless there's a big trial like that at least right now. So many states you can't get this. You can certainly try if there's another indication, if they have some coronary disease or something like that. If they have COPD, they can get cardiac rehab. Generally, you should try to do this when you can. If you can't pay for cardiac rehab, um, encourage them, try to motivate them to exercise because it is very effective. It improves exercise capacity and quality of life. Finally, again, once you've made that diagnosis, um, when I say HEFPEF, I'm excluding all these other things that are different. Yeah, these are all heart failure, and yeah, they're all normal EF, but they're different diseases. I am, when I talk about HEFPEF, I'm excluding hypertrophs, T, severe TR, MR, AS, uh, coronary disease, constriction, high output failure. Um, so those are all different things. So you really want to think about each one of these points on the differential diagnosis when you're evaluating patients because, um, and this might be, failure to do this might be one of the reasons that some of the clinical trials have failed, um, by the way, because uh, people weren't carefully thinking about all these different individual phenotypes. So when I use the word half pef I am saying we've excluded all these other people and, and we've got this sort of idiopathic disease that's associated with comorbidities. Okay, so in the last few minutes here, not all HEFPEF is HEFPEF. So those are all non-HEFPEF HEFPEFs or heart failures with preserved EF. This is somebody else. Comes in with clinical heart failure. That's their echo. Like, uh, like any good cardiologist, you uh, do a thorough HE and T exam. And uh, they got a big tongue. And then you... You take them to the lab and do a biopsy, and we see this apple green birefringence. So the diagnosis is cardiac amyloid. So cardiac amyloid, not as uncommon as you think. Uh, there's about 20 proteins that can form amyloid, uh, but there's only a few that go to the heart, and really only two that you need to know. Um, AL, which is from bone marrow, from plasma cells, bone marrow disorder, primary systemic AL-type amyloid, or TTR, transthyretin. Uh, TTR stands for transport thyroxin and retinol, if you're interested. There's two types of TTR. There's a familial kind, which tends to be more common in African Americans, can be very severe, can be mild, very wide spectrum. Uh, it's a less stable protein that folds abnormally and causes um, early on very, very severe heart failure. There's also um, so-called wild type, which we used to call senile, but a lot of these people are getting this in their 60s and 70s, and they don't like being called senile, so we just call it wild type TTR amyloid. That's more common, um, that's more benign, but still something that we need to think about. There is so-called AA type amyloid from people with really bad chronic untreated rheumatoid arthritis, but very, very rarely causes cardiac involvement. So these are the two types to know, transthyretin and AL. So um, we have a new non-invasive test for this. Uh, it's actually not new. It's, this is back to the 80s, uh, technetium pyrophosphate scans. So the amyloid areas seem to avidly take up the pyrophosphate. And if you've got a patient with the clinical picture of amyloid, like that echo that I showed you, and no evidence of a gammopathy on electrophoresis or SPEP, um, that's pretty good evidence that they probably have um, TTR types, or so-called senile cardiac amyloid. So not, this is brand new, again, probably not going to be on the test, but this is out there for your, for your information. How to screen, who to think about it, ECG, this is the classic board question, right? They've got LVH on echo, but then low voltage. In reality, that's not very sensitive. There's lots of patients with normal voltage, so um, the absence of low voltage does not exclude amyloid. Echo and MRI are very useful. There is um, abnormal patterns of gadolinium enhancement on MRI, but they don't tell you what type of amyloid. So it's good to kind of move you along, but it doesn't give you the subtype. Definitely immune electrophoresis and plasma light change for AL-type AL amyloid. Do a fat aspirate. It's less invasive than endo endomyocardial biopsy, but don't stop if it's negative. If they have AL amyloid, 80% of those patients will have a positive fat aspirate, 
but only 15% of wild-type TTR. So it's not a good rule-out test, especially for TTR amyloid. The pyrophosphate scan is a little bit better. You can use that. It's got better sensitivity and screening. But again, despite all of this, if your clinical suspicion remains, you need to take them and get a histopathologic diagnosis. That's the gold standard. You get the tissue. You can, you can then send it for subtyping and know exactly what type of amyloid you're dealing with. Treatment, we talk about these the whole meeting. Um, this is my amyloid clinic. Don't do it. So they come in on the ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and I stop them. Because these people, they need their neural hormones. That's what's keeping them upright. You know, keeping them walking around. They, they, they just do not tolerate this well at all. So they don't have the same kind of excellent response to afterload reduction and beta blockers. Um, so we generally avoid those. Judicious diuretics treat the underlying disease. Treat the underlying disease if they have AL. Um, you refer them, obviously, um, to a hematologist oncologist. They can get stem cells. They can get chemo, uh, various monoclonal antibodies. If they have TTR, there's nothing right now um, for the wild type, but there are several clinical trials that are um, trying to refold or chelate or do all sorts of approaches to prevent that uh, deposition in the muscle tissue. There is a familiar, for the familial TTR, that's, that abnormal protein is made by the liver. So if you do a combined heart and liver transplant, you can cure those people. And then you can piggyback that liver to somebody else because that liver works just fine. Otherwise, it, you know, makes bilirubin and albumin and all that stuff that it's supposed to do. Um, it, it, it's going to cause amyloid in somebody else, but only after 50 years. So that's not really a problem for somebody who's waiting for a, for a, for a liver. Cardiac transplant, again, um, really highly select cases. We've done it sometimes, but it's certainly not something that's common, and especially when there's a lot of extra cardiac involvement. Uh, they really aren't transplant candidates in those circumstances. So that's a lot of material. In summary, HEFPEF is very common. It's half of all heart failure. It's increasing in prevalence with our aging population, particularly with the obesity epidemic. Diagnosis is very challenging. There's not universal agreement on how to do it, but basically it relies on normal heart size, normal EF, and some evidence of high filling pressures or inadequate cardiac output. This can be with exam, chest X-ray, BNP, echo. When it's not clear, do a cath. Treatment, nothing proven. No pharmacotherapy is really proven. Diuretics certainly treat their hypertension, but be careful to overdo it. Think about revascularization if they have coronary disease. Think about cardioversion um, or restoration of sinus rhythm if they're in AFib. Exercise and weight loss for everybody for sure. Enroll them in a clinical trial. Uh, and then for amyloid, again, high index of suspicion. The treatment is based on what type it is. But if you keep thinking about it, those patients are out there, you're going to find them. And at long last, I will stop and thank you and good luck on the test.